Welcome back to How to Fix Democracy, uh, the show about the future of democracy. We're in our fifth season, and this, uh, this year we're focusing on 100 years of American democracy from 1924 to 2024. There is a single individual who perhaps has shaped American democracy for the better, some people might suggest for the worse over the last 100 years. It's Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, as he's popularly known. We're thrilled today that we have the former director of the FDR Library, um, Paul Sparrow, on the show. Paul is currently working on a book about uh, FDR and democracy, so he's an ideal person to think about FDR and American democracy. Paul, welcome to How to Fix Democracy. Thank you for having me. Paul, easy question to kick off with. How important do you think FDR is um, in the survival of American democracy over the last hundred years? I think it's arguable that he is the most important American uh, in the pres preservation of democracy as we know it today. Uh, and I would think part of the success he had was because of his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and as a team, uh, they were remarkably effective in communicating why democracy met, why freedom was important, but more importantly, they basically changed the relationship between the federal government and its citizens. How close did democracy come to falling into profound crisis? Uh, in the early part of the 1930s because of the Great Depression? I would say it was in uh, existential crisis on March 4th, 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated president. Uh, the banking crisis alone uh, had American capitalism and American democracy teetering on the brink of disaster. Uh, and there were a lot of people who were questioning whether democracy itself could survive. You saw the rise of fascism and totalitarianism and communism in other parts of the world. Uh, and there was a real question whether democracy worked anymore. Um, and I think America was particularly vulnerable to this because of the nature of the previous administrations. Um, you know, for 12 years, uh, the laissez-faire Republicans had been uh, running the country. They believed their job was to help big business and to help the banks and that they had really no responsibility to help the common man. Uh, and so when the system collapsed, when the banking system collapsed and people were desperately trying to pull their money out and when the banks didn't have the money to meet the demand, the banks would close and they would fail and people couldn't get their money out. The whole industrial complex collapsed. And this was a moment where the laissez-faire Republicans had no answers. They didn't know what to do. Uh, their philosophy had always been, well, just wait and the market will correct and everything will bounce back and be fine. And of course, after three years of this catastrophic economic uh, collapse, uh, democracy was really potentially fatally flawed. Uh, so when President Roosevelt be became president, I um, mean, the first thing he did, almost literally this first act as president of the United States was to close every bank in America. Now, he called it a bank holiday, which is a lovely term. Uh, it certainly makes it seem happier, but he closed every bank in America and they stayed closed for over a week. And this was because he needed to have the time to reorganize the very nature of the relationship between banks and the federal government. And then uh, they decided they were going to reopen the banks on March 13th. And then the night before, he did a fireside chat, which really sort of underpins his entire success as a leader and as a politician which was that he changed the way the presidency communicated with the American public. Well, that, I, I, I want to get on to communications and the, the full gamut of the FDR presidency, but I, I'm not sure everyone would agree with you in terms of this very clear distinction you make between FDR and the previous three of the 20s. We've done shows on Coolidge, and perhaps you're right in the sense that 
Coolidge was hostile to any kind of government involvement in, in, in the economy. But we also did a show on Herbert Hoover, uh, who was a very distinguished engineer and a war hero, not a war hero in a military sense, but a war hero in the work he did to alleviate um, famine in Europe during the First World War. Hoover himself, uh, as Richard Smith uh, argued in our conversation, was not as foreign to the New Deal or FDR as, as some people might suggest. Is that fair or you think that that's Republican propaganda? Well, the facts are pretty clear on this. Um, after Roosevelt was elected in March, you had this long interregnum t time from early November till early March when Hoover was president and Roosevelt was president-elect. And Hoover used this time to try to persuade FDR to abandon the promises he'd made in the campaign, to try to abandon his plans for the New Deal. And there's extensive documentation about this. As late as February, late February, he hand wrote a note to FDR, had it delivered by a Secret Service agent directly to FDR, essentially begging him to support Hoover's policies, which were the antithesis of what FDR had campaigned and won the election on. So we know that he opposed New Deal policies, he opposed FDR's ideas right up to the last minute and was furious that FDR wouldn't agree to support Hoover's policies. So the evidence is overwhelming that he did not support the New Deal and in fact felt that Franklin Roosevelt was an idiot. You mentioned this interregnum. Richard Smith also acknowledged as, as Hoover's biographer that it wasn't his finest hour was this a crisis of American democracy where you had an outgoing president and an incoming president and they essentially refused to communicate with one another? They didn't refuse to communicate with one another. They communicated. What, what FDR refused to do was to accept responsibility for decisions made by his predecessor. His position was very clear. When I become president, I will enact policies that I believe in. You're president now. If you want to do this, if you want to close the banks, go ahead and close the banks. But don't ask me to support you in doing that. And I think that's a, a, a very different approach to what they both wanted to do. I also think that if you look at this moment in American history, that there was literally serious conversations going on at the peak of American corporate uh, power about whether they should launch a coup and not allow President Roosevelt to take office. Uh, there was significant resistance to his uh, assuming the presidency from bankers, from industrialists, from most of the newspaper publishers. Now many of the newspaper reporters supported him, but most of the publishers did not. So there was an intensely strong opposition to Roosevelt among the ruling elite, whereas the common man believed that he was trying to help them. And it was that overwhelming support that allowed him to win the presidency. In that sense, might it be the reverse of January 6th and Donald Trump's attempt to overturn the democratic intentions of the American people? I think they're very different circumstances. I mean, I, I do think that um, there are historical precedents for what uh, the, the insurrectionists were trying to do on January 6th, this idea of intervening in a process. Hitler did a very similar thing in Germany. You see it happening in other countries. The idea that you delegitimize the election, that allows an opening for um, a usurper to take power. Uh, in most countries, this is accomplished through military means. Uh, but in some countries, it's done through political means and through uh, coercion. So I think they're, they're different on some levels, but it goes to the same issue of what is the essence of democracy. How do we protect the key aspect of democracy, the concept that one person, one vote, that the people should be able to choose their own government? And FDR believed in this very, very firmly. As a matter of fact, one of his biggest conflicts with Winston Churchill uh, arose around the Atlantic Charter where they said that all people should have the ability to choose their own forms of government. And of course, to Churchill, this was a catastrophe because India was already on the verge of revolt and he didn't want the British Empire to be split into a, a million different sections by independent voting. He wanted to keep the British Empire together and Franklin Roosevelt felt very strongly that every individual, every country should have an opportunity to select their own government. You ran, as I said at the beginning, 
uh, of this conversation, called the FDR Library for, for many years. You know this man as, as well as, as anyone inside out. What was it, or what is it about him that makes him so remarkable, whether you love him or hate him? I don't think anyone would deny that uh, he was a remarkable man. Can we credit his mother, his upbringing, his class? Franklin Roosevelt is an enigma on many levels. Um, and one of the great frustrations for historians is that he never got to write his memoirs. He didn't keep a diary except for a short period during World War I. He didn't communicate uh, within his inner circle what his true thoughts were. I always say that there were two different Franklin Roosevelts. There was the superficial Franklin Roosevelt, which was always in a good mood and smiling and making jokes and incredibly charming with enormous charisma, who just exuded this confidence and this positivity uh, throughout everything. Even in the darkest moments of his administration, he always projected this sense of confidence and faith. And then there was the inner Franklin Roosevelt, which he kept deeply hidden, which was filled with the challenges of being paralyzed about not even being able to put your shoes on, not being able to go to the bathroom by yourself, not being able to get dressed. Every moment of his life, he teetered on the moment of a catastrophe of falling down in public, not being able to get up. So I think that understanding that as sort of the core dilemma around who Franklin Roosevelt was, you have to start with that. The effects of polio on his life and his ability to sort of compartmentalize all these different components in his life. I also think that polio really fundamentally changed his emotional outlook. It did add a dimension to his personality that had been missing. You could say he was cavalier, you could say he was somewhat um, ambitious, but after the polio he began to have an empathy towards people who were struggling, people who had problems, people who were poor um, in a way that he hadn't prior to that. So I think it was very important in his later presidency that he had had that period of being in the wilderness as he was recovering from polio. There's nothing about him that is simple. I think the only way you can really understand FDR is a comment he made to uh, Secretary, Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau uh, when he says, I'm a juggler. I've always been a juggler. I never let my left hand know what my right hand is doing. And that really sums up how he manages the government and it's a very tricky maneuver. There seems something inherently political about him. You've noted, Paul, that he was a man who was difficult to figure out. He didn't display his emotions. He was a deeply private man, but also enormously talented politically. Had he just read Machiavelli, or was he just naturally brilliantly political? I think he evolved over the years and became a much more effective politician. Um, he understood that you can't get too far out in front of the American public if you want to lead. As he famously said once, you know, there's nothing worse uh, than leading a parade and looking over your shoulder and seeing that there's no one following you. Uh, so he always tried to find a practical balance. Uh, he was not nearly as radical, certainly in the early years of his administration, as he is accused of being. Uh, but he did have a, a driving philosophy, which was that fairness and opportunity should be equally divided. And that America had evolved into a country where there was no equality, where there was not equal access to opportunity, there was not equal access to capital, uh, and that huge sections of the population had essentially been disenfranchised for a variety of reasons, racial, religious, ge geographic. And so what he wanted to do was to find a way to make society fairer so that the people who needed help could get help, that the government would take on that responsibility, a responsibility that the federal government had never accepted in the past, and certainly one that Herbert Hoover adamantly opposed. And then he was not ideological. He was practical. He wanted to find solutions. I mean, one of the common traits you see in his administration is that he would appoint two people to essentially the same job and then see which approach worked better. Um, as he said, you know, the American public demands action and action now. Uh, and he knew that we had to try something. If it didn't work, try something else. But that forward momentum of doing things, if they don't work, abandoning them, you know, some of his most significant uh, early legislation from the first hundred days, you know, within years the Supreme Court had overturned them and ruled them unconstitutional. Uh, 
Uh, and he was already working on how do you rework this? How do you keep the concept of fairness? How do you provide opportunities? How do you create jobs? How does the federal government create jobs for people? And he came up with some brilliant ideas, the Civilian Conservation Corps, you know, where millions of young men were put to work. These men were literally starving, <laughs> and yet put them to work, a dollar a day, $30 a month, $25 goes back to your family, you get to keep five, we'll put you in these barracks, we'll give you food and housing. Um, and those people who worked in the Civilian Conservation Corps, many of them went on to become important leaders during World War II. Paul, you mentioned uh, Hoover again. Hoover, of course, was a self-made man, born into poverty, really did indeed create himself. Roosevelt didn't. He was born into privilege, and he led a privileged life, for better or worse. Is there a connection, do you think, between his recognition of the flaws of American democracy and his aristocratic background, did he recognize that contradiction? And might it require an aristocrat to recognize the, the, the paradoxical nature of American democracy? I think that's a great question, and I think it goes to the great enigma of Franklin Roosevelt. H.W. Brands wrote a beautiful book, uh, Traitor to His Class, about Franklin Roosevelt and about this issue that so many of his peers, especially his mother's peers, really didn't understand why he was trying to ruin their lives. Their lives were perfectly good. Who cares about these poor people? Who cares about these immigrants? Who cares about these refugees? Why are you attacking us, your people? The traitor to his class. And I think for Roosevelt, it wasn't so much a class issue as it was a fairness issue. Was, uh, aristocrats, not great fans of FDR, suggested that, was, that he was a socialist. Is there any truth to that? It, the, the term socialist and the term communist and all of the um, critical insults that were lobbied against FDR are based on attempt to create political damage. Um, socialism is a very specific form of government. Um, now you could say that Social Security, for example, is a tenant of socialism. The idea that uh, if you pay into a certain so form of governance, that the government then has a responsibility to take care of you when you get older, when you get injured, you can no longer work. But that really isn't socialism in the larger sense of what socialism is. Uh, I think both fascism, communism, socialism are all areas in which you are trying to diminish the role of the individual in the process of government. FDR believed the exact opposite. He believed in empowering the individual to choose their government, to select how they're represented, and to move the country in a ward in a way that the maximum number of people will benefit from the government's policy, not the minimum number of people, which had been the practice in the past. Another criticism, and, and you know all the criticisms much better than I do, Paul, is that he was a man greedy for power, and often the chapter around the Supreme Court is, is, is dredged up for that. Did he always respect the norms of democracy or if, uh, was he eager to establish an FDR style, if not authoritarian government, certainly a government which wasn't in the spirit of the Constitution? I think FDR wanted to find a way to make the American government more responsive. Uh, his frustration with the Supreme Court uh, was very specific. These were, uh, you know, nine elderly gentlemen who had been fairly disconnected from the reality of society, um, and the country was facing a crisis, and like Herbert Hoover, the Supreme Court were applying old rules to new problems. Uh, I think attempting to pack the court was one of his biggest political mistakes of his career, um, and it was almost immediately rejected by his own party as well as by the voters. But I think what he was trying to do there is find a way around an obstacle which was preventing the implementation of what he thought were policies that would help a vast number of Americans. And they did. I mean, the, you can continue to have the argument, you know, some say, Hoover said for the rest of his life that FDR's policies, you know, prolonged the Great Depression. And yet every year he was president, the gross domestic product went up. Every year except 1937, unemployment went down. Every year that he was president, the quality of life for a vast majority of Americans improved. Now, it was starting at a pretty low point, but there's no question that his policies were making a significant change. 
obviously once the war started and the industrialization of American uh, manufacturing to create uh, weapons of war, you know, unemployment went essentially to zero. But throughout that period, everything that he was trying to do, including challenging the absolute, absolute power of the Supreme Court, was designed to try to find ways to make the American government more answerable to its people. Uh, I don't think he wanted to be some great dictator. As a matter of fact, he constantly talked about why it was important that the American system work, that he believed in the American system. He was trying to preserve democracy in the face of this. Um, you know, when the big debate arose in 1940, whether he was going to run for a third term, and the press had made fun of him as the great sphinx, you know, because he wouldn't reveal what his intentions were. I personally believe that until really late 1939 and, and really until May 1940, when Germany invaded France and Netherlands and Belgium, that he wanted to leave office. I mean, he was building his presidential library in Hyde Park starting in 1937 and 38. It was scheduled to open in June of 1941 because he assumed he was going to leave office at the end of January. So I don't believe he wanted to create some kind of, you know, royalty, some kind of dynasty, some kind of, you know, dictatorship that he would be in charge of. But I do think he wanted to ensure that American democracy survived this onslaught of totalitarian and fascist aggression which was happening around the world. And that's why he actually ran for a third term. History is, of course, repeating itself in, in all sorts of odd ways in the 2020s. Paul, uh, in one way, you talked about a Supreme Court being out of touch with uh, the ideas of the American people. Is history repeating itself in that sense? Is the crisis, perhaps, of the Supreme Court, particularly around abortion, is that reminiscent of the age of FDR? And what would FDR have made of it? Well, I think most people don't understand the history of the Supreme Court. First of all, there were not always nine Supreme Court justices. The number of justices has fluctuated throughout time. Uh, and, and originally, the number of Supreme Court justices were determined by the number of federal districts. Um, and when they expanded the country, more Supreme Court justices were added. We now have 12, so you, we could easily say that there should be 12 Supreme Court justices based on historical precedent. But I think more importantly, you have to understand that the role of the Supreme Court uh, was de decided by the Supreme Court. <laughs> if you look at the case with Marshall, uh, when he was Supreme Court Justice, he said, basically, well, we have three branches of government. We're going to make sure that the Supreme Court is the one who decides what's constitutional and what's not. So that nature of that power, which has evolved somewhat over the years, has always created conflict. There's always been controversy around the Supreme Court. If you think about some of their terrible decisions, the Dred Scott decision, <laughs> I mean, they, they made a lot of really bad decisions over the years. And the politics of the court has always been, shall we say, fraught. But there was a certain expectation of a quality of jurors. You know, these people were supposed to be deeply immersed in either legal or political foundations of American democracy. And as they served on the Supreme Court, first of all, few of them served for 30 or 40 years like you're starting to see now. And although there was always a political element to who was appointed to the Supreme Court, it had nowhere near the sort of partisan intensity uh, that you see today. And so I think the court itself has undermined its authority um, as it had during the Roosevelt administration, but in a different way. Paul, you suggested earlier that the FDR presidency was a partnership between him and his wife, Eleanor. Tell me more about that. How central was Eleanor to the New Deal, to the FDR presidency? Would it have been profoundly different had she not been around? In my opinion, Eleanor Roosevelt was the conscience of the administration. Um, Franklin Roosevelt was pragmatic. He was trying to get things done. He was trying to balance uh, his coalition, which was very complicated. You had these racist Southern Democrats who controlled most of the major committees in Congress. You had this Northern labor union movement, and you had an increasing involvement in black Americans uh, switching from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And he had to try to hold this coalition together when they had radically different agendas. Um, so I do think there's a component that Eleanor brought to this, 
which was that she made the black American community feel as though she really cared about them because she really cared about them. She went out of her way. You know, she fought for years for federal anti-lynching laws, a law that FDR refused to endorse because he knew if he did, his Southern Democratic uh, congressmen and senators would essentially um, stymie any of his New Deal legislation. Uh, she was a great, great champion of immigrants and of refugees uh, and of fairness and equality. She was one of the major voices in the early New Deal trying to understand the role of labor unions and fought you know, ferociously for women to be able to unionize uh, and, and have that sort of protection as well. So she brought a, a purist concept. She would always say, what's the right thing to do here? Whereas FDR would always say, what can I get done? Uh, and again, her impact on FDR goes back to their earliest days when they, before they were even married, when she took him to the settlement houses in New York where she worked and showed him how these immigrants were living, you know, 20 people to a small room in these horrid conditions in these tenements. And FDR was shocked and said, I can't believe people live this way. So she started him on that path of opening his eyes to the reality of poverty, of immigration, of inequality. Uh, and then throughout their marriage, although their marriage was obviously deeply flawed uh, after FDR had had an affair in the 1918-1919 uh, period, um, and they were partners much more than they were lovers in the traditional sort of marital sense. Uh, and I think that her role, he always respected her, he used her often, he would send her out to do something, and if people criticized her and said, why is your wife out visiting prisons? Why can't you control her? And he would just say, oh, well, she's my missus. I have no control over her. And that gave him a way to, to feel out, is that policy going to get a lot of pushback? Can we move forward in that direction? And she was very valuable to him in that way. Wasn't it very convenient, though, for FDR to have Eleanor as his moral conscience, particularly, for example, uh, in the context of the issue of African-American political and economic rights. Not much changed under FDR, of course, the excuse was that he couldn't maneuver his way around the Southern racists who you've already mentioned. Uh, you're obviously a big fan of FDR, but there is some area where one can criticize, particularly when it comes to race, isn't that, Paul? Absolutely. Um, I think it's important to understand both his cultural context, um, what the average American believed at that point, what science believed at that point, which was that uh, blacks were inferior to whites. Um, there was a whole science around this, um, that most Americans were anti-Semitic, uh, they were anti-immigrant, they were um, certainly feeling superior to blacks and didn't really think they deserved equal rights. So that was the, con that was the cultural context at that moment. Uh, I think, you know, FDR's refusal to support the anti-lynching laws, I think, goes to the moral dilemma which he faced, which is that he knew federal anti-lynching laws was the right thing to do, but he didn't think he could accept the political damage that it would cause. Paul, Roosevelt was a master of modern media. Many people see him now as the first real modern American president because of his mastery of, of radio and then even of television. Uh, and, and in that sense, he contrasted dramatically with Herbert Hoover, who was enormously awkward uh, with any kind of media. How aware was Roosevelt of media and of new technology in terms of building this image, this brand, uh, as this modern CEO-like figure in America? Franklin Roosevelt's use of media was both unprecedented and inspiring as a way to understand how he could communicate with the American people. Uh, now, he had learned about the power of media uh, in newspapers when he loved to brag about the fact that he was a journalist because he was the editor of the Harvard Crimson when he was in college. Uh, and he always sort of sided with uh, journalists in a lot of these issues. And he had, during his administration, 997 press conferences, 997 press conferences, more than almost all other presidents combined. And he would do 
particularly in the early days before the war started, two a week in his Oval Office where 50, 60, 100 reporters would come into his Oval Office and he would have these informal meetings with them where he would tell them what they could report, what they could attribute to him, what they could and what was off the record. And so he was using the print media, which was, of course, the dominant media of the day, to help shape public opinion, oftentimes in a way that couldn't be traced back to him. But he also wanted that personal connection. He wanted to use the radio as a way to communicate with the American public in an intimate setting. Now, if you listen to his recordings of his speeches, say, his great, you know, his first inaugural speech, where the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, or his campaign speeches, uh, like a lot of people at the time, you're using the radio at that point as a megaphone. You're using it to reach the people in the back of the hole, to reach as many people as possible. If you listen to the fireside chats, they're completely different. He's seated, often in a quiet room. Uh, and they use the diplomatic reception room for these. He would speak as if he was talking to one of his neighbors sitting across the kitchen table. He would speak in a calm, low voice. He would rarely raise his voice. He would use the thousand most commonly used words. He would explain things in very simple ways. Uh, in, in the first inaugural address, or, or his first fireside chat, he says, you know, it is safer to keep your money in a reopened bank than under the mattress. Now, it's a simple image everybody can understand, but why it was so effective is because people were keeping their money under their mattresses. So he was able to relate to people in this intimate way. And families would sit around the the radio and listen just intently. Uh, some of his radio broadcasts had attracted, you know, 75 or 80 percent of the Americans to listen to these broadcasts. So he used it very, very effectively. Eleanor Roosevelt also was brilliant at using media, both print and radio. Not only did she do a lot of radio broadcasts, but after 1935 she had a six-day-a-week newspaper column that appeared in hundreds of newspapers. And oftentimes it was sort of light. I had lunch with this person at the museum and we went to this show and we did this. And then she'd sneak in, by the way, Americans' educational system is grossly unfair to blacks and we need to build better schools for blacks in the South. The same column, you know. So both of them, with different agendas, used media in a way no one had ever used before. And certainly Eleanor Roosevelt completely redefined the role of the First Lady uh, and was criticized for it because she was paid for these things. Almost all the money she made, she gave back to charity, but it was a controversial area. I don't think you see a more effective president in terms of the use of media until John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. I think those three presidents are essentially responsible for uh, the evolution of the presidency as a media platform. What do you think he would have made of all the anger, the resentment, the hatred on some of these platforms these days? It would have seemed very familiar to him. Um, people always cast a rosy glow on the past, but the period, particularly that period of uh, 1938 to 1941, America was an angry place. Uh, I mean, the isolationists had these huge, massive protests. I mean, he was burnt in effigy. Uh, people hated him. I mean, you know, it was always a sort of a joke now, but back then they would refer to him as that man in the White House because they refused to say his name. Um, there was a hit put out on Eleanor Roosevelt by the KKK. So, you know, the, hatred is not a new thing. Uh, the, the sort of vile kinds of uh, political reporting in the far-right newspapers and the far-right media back then um, is very similar to what we're seeing today. Father Coughlin, who was a Catholic priest out of uh, Detroit, you know, had a radio broadcast with millions of listeners, and he just spouted this anti-Semitic, vile, anti-immigrant, anti-Roosevelt broadcasts uh, that, again, people today would say, oh, wow, that's pretty nasty. Um, so I don't think today's political environment is particularly different. I do think you see a rise in a rejection of knowledge and a rejection of science. That's, that's new and unique. Uh, but there were conspiracy theories back then. There was hatred and, and animosity and pretty vicious partisanship um, going on during Homeless's entire administration. Paul, one of the striking things about Herbert Hoover is he never seemed to be able to escape his presidency. He worked like a madman and failed. Roosevelt worked very hard, but never quite as hard. He had his own life, you know, love of the sea, for example. He was able to escape. Was that another reason why he was such an enormously successful president, that he was able to, to have another life, a private life, a love of the sea and of nature and some of his houses? This is a very complicated question because um, unlike every other president, FDR was very 
restricted in what he could physically do. So particularly during the early days of his administration, he would be seated at his desk for 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And if he wanted to do anything, someone had to come over and move him into a wheelchair and take him to the bathroom or take him to a lunch or take him to a meeting. He couldn't just get up, you know, and, and walk around or go do things. So he had periods of intense work, and then he would have these periods where he would relax. And again, in this very siloed way that he worked, the very compartmentalized um, agenda for his day, uh, he would always put aside certain times to work on his stamps. Why was he a big stamp collector? Because he couldn't walk, and so he could do a stamp collection seated, seated down. Uh, why did he insist on having a swimming pool put in the White House? Because swimming was one of the few exercises that he could do. Uh, and of course, with his famous polio rehabilitation center that he built in Warm Springs, Georgia, part of that was the Warm Springs there that allowed him and other polio uh, victims to exercise, to feel a sense of freedom that they couldn't when they were subject to gravity on the, on the ground. So FDR would find ways to escape. And one of the ways he loved to escape the most was to go out on the water. He had grown up sailing. The family had a home on the Hudson River. They had a home up in Campobello in Canada. His families built clipper ships and they were involved with the whaling trade and his grandfather was involved with the uh, opium trade in China. His mother at the age of eight took a clipper ship to China and lived in Hong Kong for two years. So there was this deep uh, sort of nautical tradition in his family uh, and he loved the sea. He loved the Navy um, and so he would often find his escapes by going out on a ship. Um, in the early days, he would use the presidential yacht. After the war, he would go out on destroyers and battleships and light cruisers uh, and go for cruises in the Caribbean or through the Panama Canal or to Hawaii or to uh, England, uh, Europe for the conferences. So his deep understanding of naval history, and in his private book collection, there are over a thousand books just on naval history. He has 72 biographies of John Paul Jones uh, in his collection. And so he had this deep knowledge of particularly American naval history, as Winston Churchill did of English naval history. I mean, he was the first Lord of the Admiralty in World War I, and with the start of World War II, he was again appointed to the first Lord of the Admiralty before he became Prime Minister. So the two of them really bonded around this idea of how do you project naval power in this global conflict that was World War II. And it's one of the reasons they were so successful, because they both understood that unless you fixed the problem with the North Atlantic, unless you found a way around those German U-boats, England would fail and Germany would win. Final question, Paul. Should we, in the 2020s, should we be nostalgic for FDR? Is nostalgia healthy? I don't think nostalgia is what we should be doing. I think we should be learning lessons that were learned back then and try to find out how we apply them today. If you look at the issues he dealt with back then, income inequality, international terrorism, global powers, um, the rise of domestic fascism and domestic terrorists, the rise of international conflicts that were beyond the scope of the, any one organization to, to provide itself, environmental degradation, the use of power as a political tool, the use of oil and energy as a political tool. Uh, these are all things that they dealt with then and we can learn from what he was doing and how he addressed those problems, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. Uh, that's the book that I'm trying to write, is about how was he so persuasive? And it, he was persuasive because he always built up from the bottom. Here's the situation, here's what's going on, here's what we plan to do about it, here's what I need you to do to help me. And so that pyramid that he would build would allow the public to get involved and to help correct mistakes that were directly impacting them. And I think. Those are lessons that we can learn today. He had very fractious uh, political environment that he was dealing with. Yes, he had super majorities in both houses of Congress for many years, but those super majorities were very ephemeral because half of them you know, involved Southern Democrats who disagreed with most of his policies. So I don't think we want nostalgia for some golden era because it was a terrible time to be alive, but I do think there are lessons to be learned. Well, Paul Sparrow, one of the great authorities on FDR, I want to thank you so much for uh, speaking so fluently and broadly about the achievements of FDR, particularly in the context of uh, American democracy. Thank you so much for appearing on How to Fix Democracy. Thank you, and I think that uh, FDR would love the, su the subject matter of how to fix democracy because he dedicated his life to it.
Can you line him up for an interview, Paul? I'll give him a call.